Simon Hadley, born on March 27, 1685, and died sometime after 1723, was an English sailor involved in two hazardous privateering voyages to the South Pacific Ocean. On the second voyage, with his ship beset by storms south of Cape Horn, Hatley shot an albatross, an incident immortalized by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Born in 1685 in Woodstock, Oxfordshire, Hatley went to sea in 1708 as part of Woods Rogers' expedition against the Spanish. Rogers circumnavigated the world, but Hatley was captured on the coast of present-day Ecuador and imprisoned in Lima, where he was tortured by the Inquisition. He was released and returned to Britain in 1713. Hatley's second voyage under George Shelvock was the source of the Albatross incident and also ended with his capture by the Spanish. As Hatley had, at Shelvock's direction, looted a Portuguese vessel on the coast of Brazil, the Spanish this time held him as a pirate, though ultimately they released him again, deciding that Shelvock was the more culpable party. Hatley returned to Britain in 1723 and hastily sailed to Jamaica to avoid trial for piracy. His fate thereafter is unknown. In 1797, William Wordsworth, having read Shelvox's account of that voyage, suggested Hatley's shooting of an albatross as the basis of a contemplated joint work with Coleridge. Wordsworth dropped out of the project soon after, but Coleridge continued, and the poem was published in Lyrical Ballads in 1798, containing poems by both men and assuring Hatley a place in literary history. The oldest child in a family of Hatters, Simon Hatley was born on March 27, 1685, in Woodstock, Oxfordshire, England. His parents were Simon and Mary Hatley. Simon Hatley's mother's name at birth was Mary Herbert, and her son later stated while imprisoned by the Spanish she was a Catholic. Her faith and name at birth possibly meant she was related to the Earls of Pembroke, for they were also Catholic with the family name Herbert. The Hatley family was a prosperous one, owning a large house and three other rental properties on the high street. The residence was pulled down and rebuilt in 1704 after Simon had left home. According to Simon Hatley's sole biographer, Robert Folk, in 2010, fittingly for the family of a son with piratical leanings, it was said to have been built with stone pilfered from the nearby construction site for Blenheim Palace. Literate in Latin as well as English, he would have attended the Woodstock Grammar School up the road from where he lived. Although as the oldest son of a prosperous merchant, he could probably have followed in his father's trade. Sometime around 1699, he was apprenticed as a pilot, completing his formal training in Bristol by 1706 at the latest. In this era, the accounts of maritime explorations were widely published and read, and Hatley may have gained a love of adventure from them. <music> Much of what is known about Hatley's subsequent life is in connection with the two privateering voyages that he made to the Pacific coast of South America. Privateers were men who sailed in armed merchant ships carrying letters of mark from their government, authorizing them to plunder foreign enemies, keeping any profits for themselves and their ships' as owners. The first such voyage made by Hatley was under the command of Captain Woods Rogers during the War of the Spanish Secession, which found Britain and Spain on opposing sides. In 1708, at the age of 23, he signed on as a third mate, a junior officer position, of the Duchess, the smaller of Rogers' two ships the other being the Duke. Rogers' vessels were then being readied in Bristol for a long and difficult journey to the Pacific coast of South America. The purpose of the Rogers expedition was to go around Cape Horn into the South Pacific to damage Spanish settlements and interests along the South American Pacific coast and to capture booty for their own profit, including the large treasure galleons that sailed from Manila to Mexico. The two ships were to be crammed with men, supplies to maintain them, and with guns and powder. 
for the success of the expedition depended on being able to outfight those vessels they sought to capture and plunder. With a war on, finding qualified sailors was difficult, and in July 1708, Hatley was sent to Dublin to fill out the ship's crews with the aid of an assistant and a Dubliner, Humphrey French. The Duke and the Duchess sailed from Bristol on August 1, 1708, and Hatley joined the Duchess when the vessels called at Cork three days later. Many of Hatley's recruits were not sailors, but at the time, government regulations limited to one half the proportion of professional seamen private vessels such as Rogers's could have in their crews to preserve some for the ships of the Royal Navy. A total of 150 men joined at Cork, where the ships remained until the end of August, making good losses of 40 by desertion. When the ships sailed on September 1st, there were 183 in the Duke and 151 in the Duchess. On September 8th, the ships captured a Swedish vessel bound for Cadiz, but as Britain was not at war with Sweden and searchers could find no contraband aboard, Rogers had to let her go. This provoked a near mutiny on board the Duke, as the sailors felt they had been cheated of plunder they were entitled to. Hatley and the Duchess were not directly involved but he could not have avoided awareness of the problems, as there were tensions aboard the smaller vessel as well. The expedition captured a small Spanish ship off Tenerife, but released her in exchange for supplies. Items taken from that ship were auctioned off among the sailors, and Hatley purchased a pair of silk hose. After beating their way around Cape Horn, the two vessels stopped at the Juan Fernandez Islands off Chile for resupply. The islands were believed to be uninhabited, but as the ships approached on January 31, 1709, sailors saw a fire on shore. The landing party were surprised to be met by Alexander Selkirk, a Scottish sailor who had been marooned there by his captain more than four years before, and who was overjoyed at being rescued. The Duke's pilot, William Dampier, had also been on that earlier cruise with Selkirk, though in a different ship. Rogers made Selkirk second mate of the Duke. The ships lay in Cumberland Bay for almost two weeks, allowing for repair, resupply, and some time ashore. Having resupplied and otherwise prepared, the expedition began to raid Spanish commerce. To assure fairness, the committee of expedition members who advised Rogers decided that the officers and men of each ship would each appoint two agents, one to remain on the vessel, the other to transfer to the other ship. This meant a partisan would be able to monitor what plunder was captured by the other ship. Hatley was elected an agent for Duchess's officers and transferred to the Duke. Thus, for a time, Hatley would inspire Samuel Taylor Coleridge's albatross shooting ancient mariner Selkirk, probably the original for Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Dampier, possibly the inspiration for Jonathan Swift's Lemuel Gulliver of Gulliver's Travels, shared the same vessel. Opportunity for plunder were soon found. They captured several vessels while negotiating the ransom of the town of Guayaquil in present-day Ecuador by threatening to burn it. Hatley played his part in these exploits, being in the Duchess's pinnace as part of a planned boarding party. When the expedition's two ships fought and captured a Spanish vessel known as the Avre de Grace in the Gulf of Guayaquil on April 15th, a sea battle that killed Roger's brother John. When the main part of the expedition moved to capture Guayaquil on April 18th, Hatley was among those left behind on captured ships to guard the Spanish prisoners. With water becoming short, Hatley and another officer were detailed to command two of the captured ships. Hatley's was a bark, and go to Puna Island to collect water and seek news of the expedition. There they met Rogers and learned that the attack on Guayaquil had been successful although not as profitable as hoped. Rogers' expedition ultimately circumnavigated the globe, but Hadley did not make it that far. He remained in command of his bark as the Rogers expedition re-entered the Pacific Ocean proper. With water short and many sailors ill from a disease contracted in Guayaquil, the search for fresh water became increasingly desperate. But Hatley's ship went astray, and despite Rogers' efforts to search for her, was not seen again. Lanterns were hung and guns fired in the hopes he would perceive them, but to no avail. Hatley had perhaps six sailors under him and as about the same number of prisoners. It was thought that the prisoners had murdered him and his crew. Wrote Rogers in his account of the expedition, we all bewailed Mr. Hatley and were afraid he was lost.
with food short, one of the prisoners died, Hatley's crew forced him to make for the coast of what is now Ecuador. There, in late May 1709, a native spotted the ship, and Hatley and his crew were captured. The natives abused them, but a priest intervened, probably saving their lives. Hatley and his men were transported south to Lima, now in Peru, where they were confined to the prison on the Plaza Real. He was tortured by the Inquisition, once being taken to a gallows with one of his fellows and half strangled before being cut down. Hatley arranged to smuggle several letters out, but only one survives, dated November 6, 1709, and addressed to the sponsors of the Rogers voyage in Bristol. This one reached Britain and may have been the first news to reach Bristol about the fate of the Rogers expedition. Under the persuasion of the Inquisition, Hatley accepted conversion to Catholicism in 1710 and was freed though required to remain in Peru that December. The merchant sponsors of the Rogers expedition petitioned the British government, and in 1711, Lord Dartmouth instructed the new governor of Jamaica to do what he could for British prisoners in the hands of the Spanish. In 1713, with peace between Spain and Britain restored, Hatley was allowed to leave and returned to his native land having learned Spanish. The Rogers expedition had returned in 1711 and the sale of the goods was still ongoing, as was litigation. Hatley was paid 180 pounds, 10 shillings, 2 pence in August 1713, and later that year an additional 40 pounds for his role in the taking of the Avre de Grasse. Simon Hatley had died in 1712, leaving real estate in Woodstock to his son Simon, though with a life estate to his widow, giving her the income from the rental properties for her lifetime. In 1718, mother and son sold those properties for 140 pounds. When the War of the Quadruple Alliance from 1717 to 1720 brought a renewal of hostilities between Britain and Spain, Hatley joined another privateering expedition as second captain of the Speedwell under George Shelvock, the expedition leader. As Hatley was already familiar with their South Pacific destination, his knowledge and experience made him a desirable hire for the voyage. The Speedwell was the smaller of the two ships that went on the expedition. The larger was named success. Delayed by difficulties over their privateering commissions and a lack of favorable winds, the expedition left Plymouth on February 13, 1719. The ships became separated and sailed independently after that. Shelvock's conduct in doing so was subsequently the cause of the litigation. On June 4th at Cape Frio in Brazil, the Speedwell encountered a Portuguese ship. In spite of the fact that the Portuguese were allies of Britain, Shelvock sent Hatley across with an armed crew. They left with gold and other valuables. The ship anchored at the present-day site of Florianapolis, Brazil, from June 20th to mid-August. During that time, the crew repaired the vessel and gathered supplies in preparation for the Cape Horn Passage. At the end of July, Shelvock recorded the crew demanded new terms for for division of the expedition's plunder, saying Rogers' crew had never received the full measure of what was due them. Shelvock blamed Hatley for this episode, though whether it was a mutiny or done with the leader's connivance is uncertain, as the result left Shelvock in control of how winnings would be divided and with a greater share of the treasure. Hatley also got into trouble with the locals, insulting one of their leaders, and Shelvock, in his journal, accused Hatley of abusing the women. In his journal entry for October 1st, 1719, Shelvock recorded the incident, the shooting of the albatross, for which Hatley joined his former shipmate Selkirk in being immortalized in literature. We had continued squalls of sleet, snow, and rain, and the heavens were perpetually hid from us by gloomy, dismal clouds. One would think it impossible anything could live in so rigid a climate, and indeed we all observed we had not the sight of one fish of any kind since we were come to the southward of Strait Le Maire, nor one seabird except a disconsolate black albatross who accompanied us several days, hovering about as if he had lost himself till Simon Hatley, my second captain, observing, in one of his melancholy fits, that this bird was always hovering near us, imagined, from his color, that it might be some ill omen, and being encouraged in his superstition by the continued series of contrary tempestuous winds that had oppressed us ever since we had got into the sea, he, after some fruitless attempts, at length shot the albatross, perhaps not doubting that we would have a fair wind after it. 
This took place about 400 miles or 640 kilometers south of Cape Horn. According to Shelvock's account, Hatley shot the bird believing it portended ill luck and in the hope of fairer winds. Folk noted that at the time there was no taboo against killing albatrosses, and this was something invented by Coleridge when he wrote of the incident. Sailors sometimes baited them with food, though their oily taste was not greatly liked. A biographer of Rogers, Brian Little, suggested that the harsh treatment of Hatley by the Spanish in Lima may have contributed to the melancholy fits in the midst of which he shot the albatross. The winds did not calm, but the ship was able to round Cape Horn, battling northward along the coast of Chile through stormy weather. Once clear of the weather, the speed whale began raiding along the coast, capturing several small vessels, one of which, renamed Mercury, Hatley was placed in command of. At Hatley's suggestion, since he knew the coast, Shelvock had him operate independently to capture small vessels near the coast of Peru and Ecuador. On March 9, 1720, the Mercury's crew saw a ship that they initially assumed to be the Speedwell. It was too late to run when they realized it was a Spanish warship, the Brilliant. Hatley sent those sailors who were obviously British in appearance below trying to make it appear his ship was still under Spanish control. The stratagem failed when three sailors, British by their dress, suddenly emerged from below decks, and the Brilliant fired, slightly wounding Hatley. The British sailors, including Hatley, were captured and landed at Peta, and transported 600 miles, or 970 kilometers, to Lima. By this time, Britain and Spain were again at peace, and all the prisoners but Hatley were soon released. He was kept chained and in solitary confinement. They accused him of piracy because of the looting of the Portuguese ship at Cape Frio. A purse had been found among his possessions with 96 moidores, and he faced hanging or hard labor in the mines. There was uncertainty as to whether the Lima authorities could try him for a crime against the Portuguese, and with Shelvock's reputation poor, even among the British, he was arrested and briefly imprisoned for the incident upon his return, though acquitted due to the lack of witnesses, they decided the expedition commander was probably the responsible party. Hatley was released in 1723. What became of Hatley after 1723 is uncertain. He faced the possibility of a piracy prosecution in England because of the Cape Frio incident. Immediately upon his return, he sailed for Jamaica, then a den of pirates, without presenting himself to the owners of the Shelvrock expedition. Nothing is known of him thereafter. Folk speculated he continued as a sailor. According to William Wordsworth, the poem The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was conceived while he and Coleridge were walking together in the Quintock Hills of Somerset in November 1797. The two were considering the fate of Cain, condemned to wander the earth for killing his brother Abel for a contemplated joint poetic work. The discussion turned to a book that Wordsworth was reading. Shelvock's A Voyage Round the World by Way of the Great South Sea, in which the incident of Hatley shooting the albatross is told. Much the greatest part of the story was Coleridge's invention, Wordsworth later wrote. Though it was Wordsworth's idea that the main plot device of the narrative should involve the killing of an albatross in the South Sea, for which the tutelary spirits of these regions take upon them to avenge the crime, Wordsworth soon found their poetic styles incompatible and withdrew from the project. But Coleridge continued, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was published in their joint work, Lyrical Ballads, in 1798. Tim Beatty, in his book on the privateering voyages of the early 18th century, deemed Shelvock an unreliable witness, placing in doubt whether the albatross incident actually occurred, but considered Coleridge's use of it a testimonial to the enduring appeal of the books recounting the sea voyages. Hatley's shooting of an albatross differs in some regards from the Ancient Mariner's. Hatley shot the bird in the hopes of fairer winds. No motive is given for the mariner's deed. The shooting by the mariner is followed by retribution, the hanging of the albatross around the mariner's neck, and other torments. Hatley underwent trials and tribulations after shooting the albatross, but these were at the hands of the Spanish and were not directly connected to the killing of the albatross. The mariner is subsequently shriven by the hermit. According to folk, there was no forgiveness for Hatley, and clearly there were things to forgive. He took ship for Jamaica, fearing a second trial. Thank you.
Thank you.